oh, every time, every time I just switch to do another radio program, I just, but the Holy Spirit just comes all over me. I get excited. I can't explain it because I just know we're so close. I know we are so close. I, it's just an, I can't, it's like an, an infusion of the power of the Lord just comes over me. I know it comes over other people. I hear the testimonies of folks out there. And I just, you know, folks, we all have a sense of awareness. We have a sense of awareness. Those of us who are paying attention, uh, for you, brethren, are not of the darkness. You are the light that this day should overtake you as a thief, you know, Amen. Amen. Uh, First Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, First Thessalonians 5, verse 4. Praise Jesus. And uh, for those of us who are, who are awake and aware, the, our, our spiritual acuity, I think, is being uh, tweaked, perhaps, is the right word. I don't know what the right word is. Hallelujah. But we can see the things that are going on around us. Uh, sometimes they feel like they're moving a little bit in slow motion. Uh, many of us have been waiting for many years. In some cases, some of us have been waiting for decades. But never before have we uh, come upon a time, synergy across all elements of analysis. And what I'm saying when I say that, when I'm, my point is this, we have biblical prophecy. We have prophecies, dreams, and visions from people that if you're able to discern them and line them up, prophets that you've been tracking for a long enough period of time, because God's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his mind at the last minute. I don't foresee that. Not, you know, again, but anyway, without digressing, you have biblical prophecy that's unfolding across the world through empirical events. You have prophecies, dreams, and visions for the first time in seven or eight years that have complete synergy with the things that are happening across the earth. There are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of articles, uh, data repositories out there on the Antichrist slash Obama, if you want to call him that. Uh, you know, if you want to say, well, there's many different Antichrists and all that. OK, fine. Let's just make them one of them. <laughs> uh, OK, <laughs> if you want. Praise Jesus. All right, but when you take the Bible, the things that the Bible implicit, explicitly identifies as before Jacob's trouble, just before the Great Tribulation, we look at those, we identify those. They are happening now. For the first time in seven plus years, we have prophecies, dreams, and visions that match up to them. We have uh, prophecies, I mean, I don't even have time to go into all of them. There's so many of them, it's unbelievable. You know, I was talking to one uh, very anointed sister in Christ today, briefly. And she raised some concern about stuff people were that were, you know, things that people were saying out there, you know, in the internetosphere. <laughs> Praise God. And, you know, I, you know, I said, I said to her, well, gosh, you know, if you were in a jury, if you were in a jury in a, in a, and you had teen witnesses that all said exactly the same thing over years of time, it was a long court case. And then at some point, one of the witnesses and decided that they weren't going to, they've been saying all along, that's one of 15 witnesses. Who cares? At the end of the day, are you going to acquit the criminal? Are you going to change the outcome of the of the case over one witness? The challenge that we face, but anyway, the, the getting into that, the beauty of the situation that we have at hand right now is the Bible matches the empirical news item, you know, data point number two, or data points number two stream, if you want to call it a thought stream. But the biblical prophecies, the prophecies from the throne room of God, uh, and dreams and visions, um, all the other information that's around us that, um, you know, if you want to include, for example, the ancient information, the fallen angelic information, the uh, prognostications, if you will, of the ancient Sumerians and ancient uh, writings, and, you know, if you want to call it mythology, <laughs> praise God, everything is blending together in a perfect synergy. It all the dots are connecting, and there's this crescendo of excitement amongst those of us who are awake and aware of the time that we are in right now. Crescendo of all those dots connect. Uh, for example, people are forgetting things like Obama gave his inaugural address in the in the Denver Stadium before a mock-up of the Temple of Zeus. People are forgetting things like Obama disappeared on his magical train ride on his inaugural magical train ride across, I guess it was Virginia or wherever, Washington, D.C. and Virginia. He disappeared. It was a 
big deal. Where did he go? He ended up going to the world's largest Masonic temple. And then later it was discovered he went to meet with Queen. The Queen, if you know what I mean. For centers of evil in this world. Ultimately, the trickle-down is Lucifer, the House of Windsor, the royalty, the blue bloods at all. Every This is old news for many of us. Obama was the only president to be taken for a, quote, tour, end quote, into the uh, darkness of the pyramids of Giza. And evidently, on recordings, was recorded pointing to a carving on the wall and saying, hey, he looks like me. Quickly, we forget this synergy of all these things that have been happening across the world that all point to one thing, one, one net result. And that net result, whether it be the news in the Middle East, whether it be the, the weather reports, all the Planet X warnings, all the uh, stuff that's going on across the world, it doesn't matter. Take your pick. The earthquakes, the, the, tsuna- or the, the tsunami events uh, that are happening, uh, that have historically happened over the last 8 to 10 years, uh, just all of the stuff, the weather, the flooding, uh, incredible fires and, and unbelievable freezing and winters and, and the eight glaciers melting and the rising of the sea and all the things that Jesus warned us about that are happening right now. Do you know, folks, that nobody, but nobody in the 80s and the 70s, nobody prophesied that someone like Trump would take the presidency. But you know how many did prophesy that someone like Obama would maintain the presidency, institute martial law, and become a dictator? A good amount. Never mind the Billy Brim prophecies and some of the other ones out there that say that when Billy Graham goes to be with Jesus, that the rapture is going to happen, that the church will be taken. What is he, like 500 years old or something? I'm kidding. Praise Jesus for him. But I'm just pointing out. Think about it. 98? Something like that? He's about to go home with Jesus. I am wish I could change places with him in more ways than one. Praise God. The point is that we feel that electronic outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We feel that synergy. We know the time is now. We can't help it. Incredibly exciting. It makes... Everything have a certain sense of urgency that are going on, uh, you know, even across the world today, of course, how awful. But yeah, and they're going to get worse, folks. They're going to get worse. But there's always a shining silver lining of hope and, a, and, 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 an, and, and an incredible event. There's always movement of God, Jesus, on every cataclysmic event that occurs across the world. I even have testimony of women who were hugging uh, the pylons, the uh, the the pillars, the pylons that were holding up a, a gazebo of some type uh, in a park in Indonesia somewhere. Uh, they, they, there were Hindu women of some kind, I guess, or Hindu, I think so, uh, but, but definitely not believers in Jesus. Maybe Muslim, maybe Hindu, but I forget. But anyway, the point is, their testimony was that they saw the waters rolling toward them from the oceans, and they knew there was no power crying out to their God, so they changed and they started crying out to Jesus, and the water somehow parted around the gazebo, and they were spared. Their lives were spared. Money, folks. There's another one that bubbled up over uh, the uh, event of the unfortunate attacks in Brussels. And yes, we know these are launched by the devil. Yes, we know these are almost certainly being launched by mercenaries of darkness that are working for the, uh, well, let's call it the Luciferian shadow elite of the world, if you wish. Whatever you want to call them, or you can call it ISIS if it makes you feel better. At the end of the day, folks, it's still the devil, no matter how you slice and dice it. And our Father will be allowing judgments to roll up, ramp up, increase across the world. Nothing happens without our Heavenly Father allowing it. We are in times. Time is up. Praise Jesus. Charisma News. Let me just read this because this is directly relevant to the guest that we have on the show, uh, Beth Wilson, her testimony. Praise Jesus. Directly relevant, and I'm going to, um, I'll tell you why, but let me just go ahead and read a snippet from this article. It's just out from Charisma News. The title is How God Miraculously Spared Christian Friends During the Brussels Attacks. And it says, Friends Laura Harper and Laura Billette, or maybe Billier, came into the Brussels airport when they heard an explosion, one of the two that rocked the Belgium capital early Tuesday. Harper, who confirmed to Charisma News that she is a Christian, told AL.com prayer was one of her first reactions. 
Hallelujah. And how many others, too? Believe in my heart this is the tip of the iceberg. Coward hiding under the desk, Harper told AL.com. I thought maybe they have guns. Maybe people are going to start shooting us. Had a friend not for a snack on the way to the airport. I'm sure that was a coincidence. The two would have been in the line of fire. If we had arrived one minute earlier, we would have been right inside, right where it happened, Harper said. The explosion happened at the counter I was going to. I'm just so grateful. Praise Jesus. This is the kind of supernatural dynamic I believe we're going to see. This is just a touch, a touch, a very light supernatural dynamic that we're about to see unfold across the world in unbelievable bellows of glory that are going to move. Folks, the people who are in the darkness will see more darkness. The people who are in the light will see more light. It depends on whether or not you're a wise virgin or a foolish virgin. Again, I believe with from the bottom of my heart there's going to be a parting of the Red Sea and only those who are diligently seeking Jesus with all of their heart, that are keeping their eyes above the waves, that have their eyes focused on Him, that are, that are praying fervently for a complete sanctification and changing of their body, souls, or their flesh, their soul, their spirit in every possible way are going to be appropriately can receive the outpouring so that they can be who the Lord needs us all to ultimately become. Because when that parting of the Red Sea occurs and the, and the believers the capital C versus little c, believers across the world uh, when that occurs, there won't be time for, for people to go back and get oil in their vessel. There won't be time. The time is now. And you want to be able to receive that outpouring. You want to be able to receive that blessing now. The benefit of receiving that blessing is so unspeakably awesome that words cannot describe. I used to wonder to myself, how? How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to deal with this? Can we live Psalms 91? actually walk past dying in the streets with the love of Christ in us and not and fall over crying agony for them tated how useful can you be to the kingdom in that state to be done key here is that if you are a willing vessel serving God completely emptied seeking Jesus with all of your heart your mind your soul seeking the father everything that you do in continuous prayer if you can speak in tongues speak in tongues all day long get yourself a bluetooth device walk up and down the halls at break time talk in tongues, pray to the Lord, seek him in the morning, seek him in the evening time, turn off the TV for an extra hour every single night, get on your knees before God, ask him to infill you with the power of the Holy Spirit, do it now because we're running out of time and you want to be able to receive this peace because this peace will enable you to participate in the harvest and to become part of the outpouring, part of the outpouring of the glory of God upon the people that will draw, draw the people that need Jesus to you. You will need that supernatural outpouring pouring up to be who Jesus needs you to be. All of us do. We're all in this together. And that's why, praise Jesus, uh, we are so blessed to have with us tonight uh, Sister Beth Wilson. Uh, praise God. And to hear her testimony, when I read this testimony, folks, that surge in my spirit, I knew, I knew it was real. Not only did it mesh and blend and connect, if you will, to other uh, uh, words from the Lord, sometimes the Father isn't as direct in his prophecies as he is through his dreams and his visions. His dreams and his visions oftentimes are, they take you to that place. You get to experience it. And that's where you really can say, wow, is it really going to be like that? When you listen to the testimony of Diana Pulliam that we had on the, the one radio show a couple of shows ago, about two weeks ago, maybe three, praise Jesus. Uh, I forget the date. But anyway, just search on Diana Pulliam, P-U-L-L-I-A-M. Diana Pulliam, God, you'll find it. Wow. And that synergy, dreams that have been given by our Father to Sister Beth Wilson, this is the stuff that will enable the saints to overflow with the love, the liquid love of Jesus, and to be able to function in perfect time when most people will be falling down in agony and horror to shine the glory of Jesus. It's an enigma. It's an enigma infilled with the power and ecstasy of the Holy Spirit can possibly understand. Praise God. And it's very exciting to even consider it. And on that note, let's go ahead and bring on live uh, Sister Beth Wilson. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Praise 
Praise God. Sister Beth, are you there? I'm here. How are you, oh, John? Praise God. Oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you. Was <laughs> when I read your uh the dream that the Lord gave you about being in the presence of the guillotines and the supernatural peace that came over you. And was it your daughter? It was. It was my youngest daughter. I have a quite a large family. And um, the thing that I loved about that dream is that I had it on Pentecost. And um, Pentecost was very special to me. Ben and I had our firstborn son on Pentecost. Uh, we named him John. And so the fact that he was turning 20 on this very 20th anniversary of his life also fell on Pentecost again, and I had this dream. And so it, it meant a lot to me. I, I knew that the Lord chose that date to give it to me because the Lord knows special to me. Um, and so I had no doubt at all that this was truly a gift from the Lord. Can I preface what was going on in my life before I received the dream? Oh, please. Yeah. Uh, give us all the details that you feel led to. I This is powerful started reading the old testament prophets and uh, i don't know why but the whole time i used to read them growing up i just figured everything had already happened that the old testament prophets were seeing just things of the past i had no clue that they were seeing things in my day and one day i was reading the old testament prophets you know i, I love jeremiah i love isaiah i love hosea I love Joel, and I started realizing this hasn't happened yet. This is this hasn't happened. Not only has it not happened, but this sounds like my day. Um, and then I found a scripture, shepherds who weren't, um, I'll just say it like this. I'll read it, Zechariah 10. Uh, Therefore the people win their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. My angle, anger kindled against the shepherd. Uh, so that was Zechariah 10, praying for a shepherd. And I was going to a mega church in my town. And uh, it, it seemed a little bit more like a show than uh, feeding the sheep. And so I prayed, Lord, I need a shepherd. Lord, I need a shepherd. Lord, I need a shepherd. I would not quit. I just kept saying, there's so much here in this, in this Old Testament prophets. I need someone to guide me through this. Um, and then I found an online shepherd, started listening to him, and then a lot of fear came into me because he was truly sharing that we needed to repent. So I started repenting, but at the same time I needed uh, just more, um, and I started asking the Lord a lot of questions. A while back in my life, when I was in my 20s, I had an experience with the Lord where I prayed for rain. It was a very uh, heavy drought, and just absolutely no rain in the Atlanta area, and I lived in Atlanta at the time. So I prayed for rain and then went to work. And while I was driving the one, one mile to work, I worked in really close to my house, I looked up at the sky and I could see this cloud forming, and I was like, oh, my goodness, that's a cloud. I haven't seen a cloud in a long time. And it was swirling moisture in the morning, you know, just swirling and forming and I was totally amazed I got out of my car and I just stood there in the parking lot looking up at the sky and I was watching this this cloud form before my eyes that I had to go inside because I had to start the coffee my church as a secretary and again I was, I'm in my early 20s started reading the Bible never have read it from cover to cover probably the month of July which meant I was halfway through the Bible because I was doing the one-year Bible and um I had to go inside. I didn't want to. I just wanted to stand outside and watch this little miracle. But then I heard this rumbling. One of the ministers walked in with rain on his forehead, and he said, have you seen it outside? And I went, is it raining? He goes, yeah, but it's the weirdest thing, completely sunny across the street. So I knew that was my rainstorm, and I ran outside and ran directly into the rain. And then it, it came down in torrents, and so I went under the awning, praising God. I was like, he heard my prayer. This is my personal rainstorm. <laughs> Nobody else can claim wow. it because it's that. right here over my head. It was amazing, and it was it was watering my lawn because. Uh, but the city limits there where the church was, and so it, where the city limits stopped, so did the clouds. And then I heard thunder, and it, I knew it was the Lord's voice. It was like thunder times seven, like seven thunders going at the same time. And I just just you know chills from the top of my head down to my feet. And then thunder. I didn't. hear 
hear like words. I just heard the thunder. Then the message went into my spirit and I ran inside, grabbed the piece of paper and told the secretary next to me, cover for me. I just wrote and wrote and wrote. Finally understood this is probably how the, um, now please, I'm not saying I'm worthy to be an apostle at all or anything like that probably how they felt when they were writing the Word of God through them. Well, in that message, he told me he loves my prayers and he longs for me to pray more. And then he told me to ask him more questions that I wasn't asking enough. And he said, you have not because you ask not. I guarantee you, John, right now, a lot of people are thinking, oh, I need to ask for more stuff. No, no, no. It wasn't stuff talking about. He was talking about the glorious riches of his wisdom going to take care of my stuff. He's already promised that, right? He's already promised to give me what I need to eat and shelter and clothes, telling me to ask him questions, like really deep questions. That became part of my foundation. When you're in your 20s and God is doing something in you when you're that young, and I hope the young people who are listening really get this, that is a very special time of your life where you are impressioned in your relationship with the Lord in such a way that it's almost like your vessel is being altered and molded and you get stuck in the kiln in the 20s. So when the Lord can get a hold of some Someone that's young, he can mold that vessel before it goes into the kiln and gets a little, you know, like we are, <laughs> setting our ways. Um, you're, kind of, you're kind of like you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? <laughs> yes, it's yes. A lot so of it's truth. like you know, young people. Oh my gosh, I just pray, Father, let the young people hear this program and let them know that God is molding them right now. You're being molded right now to be a very useful vessel for the Lord, and it may feel like you're being broken and that you're being shattered to pieces. But then he adds the water and he remolds you and then you're ready for use for the God, for the Lord. So anyway, that was my 20. And he told me some other things that were very personal. When I'm asking for a shepherd, I mean, I asked and asked and asked. And then I started asking him questions. And then you know how it is when you're on the Internet. If you are not grounded, you will get up because a lot of the messages out there are not balanced the love of the Lord or with the kindness of the Lord to get us through our situations. You know, no matter what we have to do, he'll be with us and he'll get us through our situation. I had that dream on Pentecost Sunday, and I will just release some in my hand. Um, when I had the dream, uh, I knew that the Lord was taking me to my greatest. I did not feel like this was necessarily a vision of my future. I almost heard him say, let me take you to your greatest. And I didn't know what my greatest fear was. I really didn't. But my greatest fear to see my children beheaded. I could be beheaded, but my child? And so he takes me with my youngest daughter in the vision. We are in a concentration camp. My parents, my elderly parents, they're not too elderly but they're you know they're getting up there my whole family and I saw him I saw him holding our youngest child and then I was with my baby daughter my youngest daughter he was holding our youngest son we knew that ISIS had come to the concentration camp and the executions were about to begin my daughter and I said we want to go first so we had to walk uh, from our barracks to this building where they were going to do the beheadings And I was talking to the Lord as I was walking, and I said, Lord, I don't want to see their evil faces. That's what I'm afraid of the most is the darkness in their eyes and the evil in their eyes. So we walk into the building, and they're not in there yet. And then they start to open the door to walk in. And when they open the door, strange, a sheet came down over me. It was almost like he said, I'm going to hide you in the wings of my robe, put his robe over me or something. But this sheet of fabric, glory, came over me, could not see their faces. I could see like a shadow of a person, but I I couldn't really see them. And then strength came up from within me. It didn't come down. It came from within, already there, down there in my, and it came up just like tongues can come up. And I pointed at them and I shouted, you cannot take my life. I lay it down for my Savior who laid his life down for me. And then I knelt and I laid my head on this chopping block. It wasn't a guillotine. It was a rough chopping block. I noticed on my peripheral vision that my daughter right next to me and she laid her head down as well and the man above me was shaking with fear and then it got a little and I said oh great he's not going to be able to get my head off in one whack because he's too scared and I actually almost chuckled in the dream that's how easy this thing was but he whacked it off and I'm dead then I'm whole again my daughter and I get up and we don't even see the bloody mess we just get up and we were walking back to the barracks we walk into the barracks and we see Sorry to interrupt. Didn't your daughter say something to you at the time that the uh, 
that that this 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 ISIS individual is getting ready to. I thought I remember her saying something to you, encouraging. No, no okay. she so didn't say anything. Okay. I didn't even hear her witness. And, and I had a feeling she was testifying too, you know, because we, we I believe uh-huh. as martyrs we get to testify. But for some reason I didn't get to hear hers. Wow. Um, but we're walking back to the barracks and we look at the faces of pale, like this, you could see the you could see the fear on all of their faces. Mary and I are excited and we're like, it wasn't hard. It wasn't hard at all. God was so with us. He's like, speaks to us, present. It wasn't hard. And then I said, giving birth is harder, you know, and I've given birth a lot of times. I can die once. And they said, really? And then we went, wait, can you hear us? And they said, yeah, we can see you too. And I said, well, touch us. So they went to touch us and their hands went through us. And then they went to touch us again, and they did grasp us. Weird. I don't know what that part means. They it sounds went like through us, and then they did. It's just... kind of like uh, associated with when Jesus was raised from the dead, you know, and he was walking around, and people. It's like it's it's enigmatic. It's it's a mystery because, you know what I mean? Because people didn't. Yeah. Really, they kind of recognized him. You know what I mean? And then he had doubting Thomas. He's like, okay, let me see your hands. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> wow. And it's like they heard his voice and they knew it was him. I mean, that's so. It's it's like a it's like mysterious and but exciting at the same time. Exactly, exactly. So so I knew that that part was important that they did touch us first time. They, and I didn't actually write that part in my my um, the email I sent out to people, and I probably should have included that little piece of because um, everything to me when the Lord gives it to you is important. Every word in the Bible is important. So they did touch us, and then we realized we were dead, and we started weeping, and we were like. Wait a minute. Why are we not with Jesus? To be dead, to be absent in the body is to be the Lord. Why? Where is Jesus? Where is he? And we could not, we could not be consoled. We were weeping all our hearts. The kind of thing where you're sobbing in your dream. You know, have you ever had a dream where you're sobbing and you're like barely breathing in your dream? And then I heard him say very authoritatively, I am coming to get you. And he sounded like angry they had done to us and that he was, and then I woke up. Wow. Now, can you? I got the impression when I was reading the letter that was going around uh, that there was a, and I think you articulated that very well. But can you explain? I think to people, uh, how how did you feel? Didn't I mean? I mean, I know that you already kind of explained it, but I mean, what was it like? A, I don't know, a, a supernatural ecstasy that came upon you. I mean. I mean, that must have been, I mean, arguably one of the most horrific places to be uh, in, in, you know, facing something so awful, but yet you seem to be, I don't know, more than just at peace, almost like, I don't know, like there was some kind of a a glory or ecstasy over you where you weren't even... Yes, it was surreal. It it was like out of a body body experience. I had a... um, The only thing I can compare it it to, and this might be why it was my youngest daughter that was in the dream with me, uh, because I have more than one daughter and it's not like I favor her or anything, but I actually had a near-death experience with the same daughter. When she was 15 months old, she stuck her hand in an ant pile and... um, I was talking to a friend, and I looked down, and she's screaming. She holds her hands up, and I can't see her hands. There's so many ants on them. And I heard, started hearing direction that said, this is bad. Take that car. And there was a car there. Uh, and I, we live on a, we had taken a walk. I didn't have a cell phone, car far away from my house, and there just happened to be a car there, somebody that was at the barn. And I started hearing directions, take the car. And I ran to the car holding her after I got the ants off, of course. And there was a key. There were keys in the ignition. I didn't even ask the person. I just took the car to my house. Ran into the house. I hear a direction, Benadryl. And so I ran to the Benadryl, and I start to get a little bit in her mouth, but then her tongue starts to swell, and her throat's closing up. And so I dial 911, and I'm just getting directions. He's telling me exactly what to do. And so I tell them, meet me at the front of the ranch because you'll never find my house in time. So I got back in the car and I sped up to the front, the ranch where we live. <clears throat> I almost pulled into the office of the ranch. This is like a, a ministry. And I hear, no, if you do that, she won't make it. And so I, so I keep straight. I'm going to the very front of the property so I can meet the ambulance there. 
And then I look down and she's turning gray. And I scream, no, God, no. You gave her to me. Did you not? And I what? just surrendered. I said, there's nothing I can do. Totally in the Lord's hands. And I said, yes, I did. I gave her to you. Because a few weeks before this happened, season of fasting and praying, and I um, went to the family portrait and I touched every child on the family portrait and um, gave them to the Lord, laid them on the altar, you know, in my heart. It's like an Abraham Isaac sacrifice. I sacrificed every child to the Lord and just gave each child to him. So that's what he was saying when he said, you gave her to me, did you not? Wow. So I get to the front of the ranch and I'm waiting because the ambulance isn't there yet. And it's just getting worse and worse. And then I, I hear him say, praise me. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do. And he goes, praise me. Like he's almost shouting, shouting at me. It's, it's loving, but it's very. So I get out of the car and I fall to my knees. I'm holding her. Raise can be. Start singing, Jesus loves me. And when I did, in the spirit realm, it was as if a snake had to come off her neck when I started no. singing Jesus loves me. I believe that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It was a lesson I learned. He inhabits the praise of his people. There's mm-hmm. power in that praise. Enemy loses his power when we praise him. So this was a very holy moment for me. It was holy and sweet and lovely and horrible all at the same time. And then I hear the sirens coming and I said to the Lord, is she going to make it? And I hear him, like I hear his voice and he goes, yes, she's going to make it. And then uh, the crazy thing about this is a week, a week or two weeks before this happened, I read an article about anaphylactic shock. I didn't know what that was before I read that article. And I had epinephrine on my tongue. And when the paramedic came, I, I knew what was going on. And I could tell him. And he just thought I had a fat baby. I had to tell him a few times, no, no, my baby's not this fat. She's swollen. And then when I said that, I tried to open her mouth and her tongue had completely engulfed her mouth and uh, gave her the epinephrine and within two minutes doing better. But later I counted the ant bites and it was like 100 ant bites on a 15 oh. month old baby. Um, so that made a very intimate connection uh spiritually I would submit to between that particular daughter and and you because you've had a harrowing experience that was supernaturally uh, supercharged with a uh, word from the Lord even as it was uh, occurring and then to actually be in you know taken into a dream. You know it's fascinating uh Job um 33, uh, verses 13 through 15 says, The Lord speaks once, yea, twice, but man perceiveth it not, in a dream or a vision of the night. You know, it's fascinating uh, how our Father can take us in. It's, you're right. It doesn't mean that you are going to be there, but he's showing us intimately what it will feel like for those that are in those positions or are taken into those positions. Um, This is the same type of dynamic that occurs with uh, the prophet Dr. David O'Rourke in Kenya when he is taken into visions of the Lord. He he explains that he's actually physically present um, uh, at the time that the missiles are going off or whatever it is where the earthquake is happening. When he looks over him, he describes it. He's actually physically there. He feels the horror of the people running for their lives. He can actually relate the emotional impact of the events that are happening and, and, and explain them as if he's like a reporter on the ground at the time. And I perceive that that's pretty much what the Lord was showing you, what 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 the, the people who are anointed with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I, I believe I believe that what the Lord showed you in this dream will will also translate over uh, to each and every one of the, 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 the members of the bride, the remnant bride of Jesus Christ, at the time that these calamities are unfolding across the earth in, in whatever capacity they unfold, whether you be standing there uh, amidst an earthquake event or you be standing there as explosions are going off in, in, your, in your city, such as what happened today in Brussels. Uh, uh, you know, wh- whatever that calamity or series of calamities might be, I believe that that supernatural peace that you personally experienced from the Lord 
what is is what is going to be ultimately happening to those uh, who are chosen to be part of that remnant bride, who are chosen to be part of that harvest. Because otherwise, how else would we be appropriate testimonies to the love of Jesus Christ? How else? If we're kicking and screaming and freaking out, we're, no one's going to believe in our faith. There had to have been an outpouring upon the martyrs in Fox's Book of Martyrs. When you read the testimony of the people who had awful, horrible things done to them, sometimes people in their early 20s, uh, you know, and, you, and you're like, how could they possibly have gone through that without kicking and screaming and, and really acting just like any other normal fleshy human would act? Uh, that would not be a, a miraculous testimony to the faith of Jesus and the faith of where they were ultimately going to be with Jesus. Just like Stephen, uh, when Stephen was stoned, uh, you don't see scripture that indicates that Stephen was screaming for his life. You see him looking up into the, the parting of the firmament and, and, and him in a state of glory and ecstasy as the rocks are pummeling against him. I think that that's what's going to happen to all of us, and I'm excited about it. I can't believe it. I'm so I excited know. about it. Now, like never before, tell me if I'm, if, I, if I'm hitting the nail on the head, but now, like never before, I'm actually excited about being able to participate in the harvest and help people, because before I was afraid, I was like, how am I going to be able to do that? I mean, and now I'm like, Lord, because I know what the ecstasy of the Holy Spirit feels like. And the, any opportunity yeah. to feel that is, is, oh my, it's overwhelming. You will do anything to feel the presence of Jesus and the touch of that glory upon you. Once you've felt it, you, that's all, the only place you want to be. You just want to go back. And if that means that we have to be out there in the midst of the you know hell on earth, Psalms 91, then praise be to the name of the Lord. God, thank you, Jesus. I cannot wait for the harvest. I mean, is that Don't is you that feel? what you feel too? Do you feel that same sense uh, of excitement? Yeah, it is. And, and I tell you, I, I went through my season. I mean, I really did. I'm going to be really honest i'm not this superhuman i went through a season you can ask my best friend depression and sorrow and mourning like i had to go through a season of mourning the loss of america because it was truly an idol in my life you know just uh, the patriotism and being in love with your nation there's nothing wrong with loving your nation but i mean it really was kind of taking a place above the lord and so started to see this being stripped away i mean i went through a morning i would take naps and i couldn't i just went through depression and fear i did i did go through that season i i feel like the lord graciously allowing a lot of us through that that break you know it's almost like uh, the stages of death there's anger there's depression there's denial, you know, those stages of death. Have you ever learned the stages of death, denial, depression, anger, yeah, and then acceptance? I, I, um, you know, you're, that happened to me. Uh, but it happens to everybody kind of like on their own terms because we all have a different right. you know, history with right. the Lord and such. But, yeah, it's it's um, the Lord has to I, the, bring you down really low listen. and break you, you know what I mean, in order for you to be able to receive it. And surrender, right. you know, surrender everything to them. I, I hope and pray people, you know, I really do want the church to wake up really, really early in the game so that we will be able to turn around and strengthen others. We need to go ahead and mourn instead of just staying in denial. And I feel like there's just so much distraction so that you can stay in denial um, and not think about it. And that's what needs to be taken away so that we will face uh, the truth of, of what's coming and um, but I agree with you. It's actually very glorious. It's very glorious. The final harvest, I, I had a harvest dream. I want to share this with you. I don't know the meaning, and I would love to know the meaning of it, but I had a dream that I was walking on, again, the ranch where we live, and, then, and there were two enormous trees, and one tree went, went all the way up to the sky. It was huge, and they were both fruit trees, too. It was an apple tree, and the apples almost as big as uh, a baby's head. They were, they were enormous apples, and I reached up, and I touched the apple, and it was getting ripe, and then I walked over to the tree to the right, and it was a pear tree, and I reached up and touched the pear tree, and it was ripe as well, but not as ripe as the apple tree, but almost, and then I got really worried that we were going to lose the harvest because there was so much that needed to be harvested. And then I woke up. And then the next couple of days, um, I went out of town and I came back home from being out of town. My teenage boys were stayed home. 
and there was this enormous apple on the counter, the same size as the apple that was in my dream. Wow. And I said, where does apple come from? Where does apple come from? And my boys were like, <laughs> what? Like, where does apple come from? I got to know where this apple came from. Oh, well, uh, to us, and we thought she told us to give it to you because she knew you would like it. I was like, yeah, it came from my dream. Um, same color, same amount of mushiness. Got in my dream and stuck on my kitchen counter. I didn't know there were such that large. I really didn't. But anyway, John, we've got to have somebody interpret that dream because... Um, it was an amazing dream and, it, and it, I don't have a lot of dreams I know it sounds like I do it sounds like I have a lot of supernatural things but I'm really giving you just about all of them and, and but that one was amazing what is this harvest why were there two trees what do they represent tenderness represent and I had that dream like in every year wow this apples it will be two years this September aren't apples coming out don't they get harvested in September I don't apples, know. Apples are hot. I, I guess I'm a city slicker. <laughs> Praise <laughs> God. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, I, I used to know a little bit about that stuff back in uh, back in the 70s when my mom and dad, well, my mom in particular and sisters, uh, back then they thought the Great Tribulation was going to happen any second now. So we had a big uh, uh, backhoe come in and dig a cold cellar. And my dad would come down at four o'clock in the morning wearing a straw hat like a scene out of the movie uh, Witness uh, with the Amish, you know, with Harrison Ford and the <laughs> Amish people. And he'd, he'd hold a flashlight in my face wearing a straw hat and going, time to pick the beans. And I'd be like, no. But um, <laughs> so I had a little taste of, you know, he's in chickens and all that, praise God. But but no, I don't know the harvest times of fruits. You know, the only thing, and I know this is, it certainly doesn't even touch the, you know, doesn't even touch the tip of the iceberg as far as what the meaning of the dream could potentially mean. But the only, but I feel in a sense, and I think you'd probably share this same feeling, that it probably has something to do with the dynamic that you see in the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew chapter 22, where, um, you know, where uh, the servants, e.g. the bride, or the people who are awake and aware like us right now, we're out there trying to wake people up. And uh, so many of them uh, don't respond. They won't respond. They wave their hands and they say, oh, I'm busy. I, you know, uh, they're naysayers. They go back to their business. They go back to their work. Uh, but the feast is ready. The feast is ready. Come to the feast. And no, 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 no. I'm not going to come to the feast. And then, then the Lord says to the servants, well, then go out and find the unbelievers and the sinners. You know, go out and find them and bring them to the feast. And they ultimately do come to the feast, and then they are guests at the at the wedding supper. And um, I think there might be some connection there because I know most of our hearts are grieving because isn't it fascinating that the most ripest harvest grounds, the har most ripe harvest grounds today are the unbelievers, the sinners, the marginal believers, the people who the, the 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 people that you might refer to as churchianity, they they're so set in their ways uh, they're, they're, they figure that they've either got a Willy Wonka golden ticket straight to heaven and they're covered. They don't have to worry about a thing. They're going to be raptured. They're not going to deal with any bad stuff, uh, you know, and, 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 or, or they have people in their church that are teaching them that a third Solomon temple has to be built before Jesus can even begin to come back. And, well, you know, the, until you see that, don't even pay no attention to all this stuff. It's just a bunch of noise. We, there's so much churchianity out there which I was deeply a part of for many years, uh, that, 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 that the, the, I don't know what what's the term, the blindness that has been pulled over the eyes of uh, God's people that should be awake, that should be aware, but the blindness is so thick that I fear that they are the ones that are going to be ultimately left behind, which, by the way, is mirrored in the report cards of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, where only one of the seven churches is ultimately ready, and that's the Church of Philadelphia. Uh, all six of these, so look at the percentage. That's, you know, six out of seven believers, six out of seven Christians don't make the rapture. 
Six out of seven Christians do not make the rapture. And that's just assuming uh, that the mathematics behind each of the metaphorical churches is equal. Um, we don't know that. So uh, that's a pretty, you know, that's a wake-up call. And it matches perfectly the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. And I think there might, I don't know what the nuances are of the mystery of your dream, but I think that the, what it, what it, the grief that we all feel, so many people have written me over the years, many people have written me over the years, and they said, John, no one's listening to me. They just wave their hands at me. They, 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 they exclude me. Uh, they think I'm crazy. They, they won't pay any attention to the warnings. I'm showing them the facts and the figures and the data, and they're just completely ambivalent. And that blindness that, that, that is in the church today, worldwide, not, not, not worldwide necessarily, there are certain underdeveloped countries like over in Africa and stuff where they're still absolutely filled with the Holy Spirit and on fire for Jesus. But in the developed countries like Europe and New Zealand and Australia and you know the United States of America and Canada, the churches are just oblivious. And that matches the the dynamics uh, uh, in Matthew 22 and Revelation 2 and 3, and maybe maybe a hint uh, uh, that leads to the revelation of your dream and what that all means. And you know, did you have a website, Beth, that you could share with somebody, or did you want people to get in contact with you, or do you want them to email me and have them contact you? Th you know, if if because people do listen and they might. Somebody might place something upon their heart as far as what that dream might mean. Right. Um, they could go to, I do have a website called communionbread.org, and I share a communion bread recipe and some scriptures, and it will have my email address that they can contact me that way. You know what, what kind of made me sad was how much fruit there was, and that I knew in the dream when I was touching it, I just knew that a lot was going to spoil, and it made me sad. You know, it's because like, this really needs to be picked right now, and there was just no one to harvest the tree. And it was enormous, two trees. I kind of wonder if the apple tree, I don't know, um, and pear tree might represent uh, another people group, but and the only reason I say the Jews with the apple is scriptures of the apple of his eye. But it um it was a it was sad. It was sad that there's so much fruit to be harvested and the Lord says pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers into the harvest field. Oh amen. And so I, I almost in my dream I almost felt like Jesus did as he's looking over probably he probably said that as he's looking over a sea of people. Um and just almost weeping in his heart that there's so many that um, in the world, you know, he he knew he knew there's a lot in the world that that need to hear. Um, I have had a spiritual breakthrough recently. I would love to share a little bit um, of some of the yeah um, part of the problem of what you call did you call it churchianity? Is that your term? <laughs> It's not just my church. Uh, and, uh, for some reason, uh, struggling to walk by the Spirit, um, and I was couldn't figure out. This, this is a recent story. I almost feel like the timing of you finding the dream, because I had the dream over a year, a year ago. But the timing of, of me being on here, I think, has something to what I've recently learned about walking in the Spirit versus walking in the carnal mind. Uh, part of me begging for a shepherd, I, I found finally found a really good church that I, you know, everybody says their church is the Church of Philadelphia, but this one truly got the most precious, fearing people in it. And, and it's a small church. And, and my pastor, um, Brian Rhodes, a man that I would call a lion, and he is constantly preaching repentance and um, always has an altar open and people go into the altar. I also found an Internet teacher that has helped me tremendously, and his name is David Murray, and his website is ewmurray.com. But he has taught me um, some of the questions. Remember how I say I ask questions a lot? One of the questions I was asking him is, Lord, why am I not able to hear your voice within me? I was going through a season where I couldn't hear him real well, and then I was really burdened for my family because I'm raising teenagers and there just seemed to be a general feeling of lukewarmness um, in my family at the time and 
I wasn't seeing any answers to prayer or any breakthrough. And then I learned this teaching about walking here versus walking in the carnal mind. And um, David Murray had us draw three circles. And you draw a little circle, and then you draw a second circle, and you draw a third circle. And he explained that our spirit man is in the, the very center circle. And before we come to Christ, that spirit man is dead. You know, it's, I'm sorry, four circles. There's a circle with, okay, so that dead. And then when we receive the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes in to reside. And he, um, so you put a fourth circle in your spirit. And then the second circle, the middle circle, is our soul. Our mind and our will and our emotions reside. That's where we make our decisions and think about what we cry about. That's all coming from the soul. And then the body is this the shell that we reside in. And he was teaching um, me that when we are born again and the Holy Spirit resides in our spirit, we now from the inside out, living from the outside in. I would, and I would look at things and go, and I would make a judgment by what I could see or what I could sense or what I could feel in my body. And I would make my decisions in my soul. And I wouldn't even go into this. I would just and this might, you might be going, really, Beth? You weren't living by the Spirit, but this truly was a problem of mine because I lived with a lot of humans. I had a lot of humans called teenagers living in my house. So I'm making a lot of judgment by what I see. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like you're watching oh, yeah. your kids and you're, how, you're judging them. I, I, I honestly do not know how people who have a lot of kids, a lot of activities, a lot of things in their lives, you know, kids, kids, you know, I mean, I'm, my goodness gracious sakes alive, my goodness, how do you do do it. I don't understand it because in order for me to be able to feel close to the Lord spiritually, I have to be, I don't know, in a, By yourself. <laughs> like, yeah, I got to turn off the TV and the radio and I got to get quiet, you know? How do you do that? Yeah. But I had this breakthrough and the breakthrough came when uh, one of the teachings talking about is that if we're not walking in the spirit, we're contending with the word of God, meaning something in God's word that we are not in agreement with. There's a lie that leads to we're holding on to a lie and we are not living according to his word. I started putting my complaints online and uh, begging people to pray for my lukewarm family. This sweet lady, I'll just call her Jane, told me to watch this um, YouTube video and it was uh, auto coning and it, the name of it was the weapon of love and it's on youtube auto coning and in this story talking about a muslim a, a missionary woman who was working in the muslim and someone placed a curse on her the missionary lady first reaction when somebody's cursing you or threatening you is fear and run away and, and hide she went to the word of god and the word of god says bless those who curse you so she went to the muslim man's garden and she noticed weeds so she started weeding his garden and he comes out and goes what are you doing and she said god told me to do this and he said god you mean allah why did he tell you to weed my garden and she said well it's your fault that god says to bless those who curse you kept weeding his garden and then she came back another day and swept his walk and w w weeded some more and did some more work in the garden and it made a big impression on him and then he had a dream where he was falling into hell and he was screaming out he could feel the flames and screaming out and he cried out woke up and then the next day went to find the missionary lady and he told her about the dream and she says well you are in danger of the flames of hell apparently that's what your dream is telling you and she ended up leading him to Christ he was so excited when he found the Lord that he let her come in to uh, their place of worship, and she started teaching the other Muslims what she knew. And this made the bigger above this priest. This was a priest in the Muslim world, and then the other one was mad at him. So he put a curse on him and threatened him. And so this man that was the priest went and started blessing the, uh, the higher-up Muslim, and the same thing happened to him. He had a dream about hell, cried out, went to the man, and he became a Christian as well. Um and I share this, I realize that this love that this woman, that what this woman was doing is she's taking the word of God and she was putting it into practice. Bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. And so blessing my children more, and not, not that my children curse me, not that my husband, we're all believers. Instead of judging them, I was like, I'm going to start blessing family, the love of the Lord. And uh, so I did. I started taking actions and, and serving them with 
with this genuine love and things are really changing within me. I am changing. I feel the love of the Lord rising up in me, teaching me how to love those that are in my life, especially those that I'm concerned about. I could share more, but I am there on the internet. I don't want to share anymore. It's a little bit too personal to share doing amazing things when I am walking. And one of those amazing things is introducing me to you, which I would have never believed anyone had told me a month ago, oh, you're going to share your dream on the internet and a lot of people are going to hear it. I would have never believed that. But now uh, when you walk in the spirit, the Lord accelerates you. I would like to know how you got accelerated because you have been accelerated and you're tremendous. Have you had a similar experience where there was a turning point where you just got accelerated? Uh Uh-huh. Well, um, I, you know, as Andrew Womack says, and I just love some of his teachings, you know, if your life's not supernatural, it's superficial. I mean, I just, it's just <laughs> one thing after another. I can't, for example, when we started this radio show, I had briefly mentioned how your dream of supernatural peace in front of guillotines uh, was um, uh, very similar and 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 directly related to uh, the testimony of Diana Pulliam, and you come on the air, you're talking and sharing your dream, and I kid you not, while you're talking, Diana Pulliam sends me an email. I haven't heard from her in four, three plus weeks since she's been on the air. I just mentioned her name, and in comes an email from Diana Pulliam. It's like I, I, I'm in a constant state of awareness that everything around me is like spiritual, and I expect supernatural coincidences to happen at any moment. I, I can't explain it. It's so, I mean, if, could I it, could I say that there was one great moment where I had this epiphany or a turning point or Gabriel stopped in and said, you know, with angels around, oh, you know, you know, and light shining down from the sky. No, it wasn't like that. But, but there, you know, years ago, about, you know, I can't believe it's been that long at this point, but years ago, I, I wanted to serve God so bad that I used to cry, uh, you know, in the shower, I used to cry and recite, uh, what is it, Isaiah 55, 8 or something like that, I forget, or 6, 8, where it says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. And I used to say it, I used to actually recite that scripture back to the Lord in tears. And now I just look back on it all, and I'm like, I just, I don't, I'm, I'm so blessed I got to tell you, honestly, Beth, when I'm not serving God, I'm kind of bummed out. You know what I mean? It's like I just want, all I want to do is serve the Lord. When I serve the Lord, when I'm working in, even if I'm standing in line at Walmart and something exciting comes over me and I turn around in the line and say, look, don't you all know that Jesus is coming? I mean, I'll do that sometimes. And I'll, and everybody will be looking at me, and there'll be a couple of ladies in their 50s and 60s, and they'll be like nodding their head, yes, we know Jesus is coming. Uh, you know what I mean? And then there's a couple of people shaking their heads. But I'll do that sometimes, and that's when I come alive. Praise God. I love it. I love serving the Lord, and I know that anybody out there who is going through that transformation from the flesh to the spirit world where they become – anointed and charged with the presence of the Holy Spirit, serving God. What a blessing that is. And and I I can't say there was any, for me, it was more of a gradual thing over time. Uh, But I don't know. But lately, it's well, been I'm, really powerful. I'm sure you're. I'm sure you're extremely blessed. It says we overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And here you are, listening to testimony after testimony, got to be transformative in your own life. I personally love biographies. I read Christian biographies all the time. I don't like to read fiction. I want to read reality and Gladys Allward's one of my favorite all time and George Mueller. I just love biographies. I think if you're listening and you want to transform your church, feeling like you're the whole show and let the people in your body stand up and testify. Do you remember 
I don't know if you grew up Baptist. I grew up Baptist, and uh, Sunday nights were always so much more fun because we could testify, and we would hear from more than just the pastor. Um, we had more of a casual Sunday night service, and we would get up and give a little testimony, and then we'd sing songs. And I just feel like that's something that the church um, is, is missing, is they're not allowing us to overcome Satan by the word of our testimony. So anyway, that's why a lot of people are going to online church, finding blog talk radio so they can hear the testimony of the body of Christ. We need to know what the other is experiencing and going through so that we can be encouraged ourselves. Because uh, otherwise we'll have a schism in our body. That's one of the things that um, I think is probably foundation in the Scripture. Arguably one of the greatest mysteries I think uh, in the Bible is uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, you see where the Apostle Paul uh, and I'll see if I can find this real quick. Yeah, here it is. In chapter 13, verse 1, 1 Corinthians, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I have become some glass or a clanging symbol. And although I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing, and, and, and although I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. And in that same breath, uh, just a couple of verses prior to that, he talks about how we are all one body. Now, the reason why I pointed out that it profits you nothing is that everything has to come out of love, and that love is spread through a unity in the Holy Spirit through the body of Jesus Christ. And if we don't have that, we won't be profited in our rewards in heaven. And here, I'll, I'll share the, this little piece in closing. I know we're getting close to the hour, but here, listen to this. But now indeed there are many members. I'm going back to verse uh, chapter 12, verse 20. But now indeed there are many members and yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body that we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our presentable parts, we have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body. The word schism means that there's a gap. The moral of the story here is that through love, through unity of the body, we are made whole through the power of Jesus Christ that is in us. And if we do not participate in the body, if we do not listen to the people who have the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, uh, um, uh, uh, the gift of interpretation of tongues, the gift of miracles, the gift of healings, the gift of faith, the gift of love, the gift of discerning of spirits, if we do not participate in that body, we will have a schism. What does that mean? We will have gaps. We will have gaps in our understanding. We will have gaps in the power of God. Uh, when we work together, united, we are going to hear the whole story. We will, we, you know, you are not of the darkness. You are the light this, at this day. You know, you, we are not of the darkness. You are of the light that this, that this day should overtake you as a thief. First uh, 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 Thessalonians chapter 5. Sorry, yeah, First Thess 5 verse 4. Okay, but you, brethren, are not of the darkness. You are of the light that this that this day should overtake you as a thief. We are enlightened through participating in the body. The reason why the people who go out, I wondered to the Lord. I said, Father, Father, please help me to understand. We brought so many guests that have that are they're on Jim Baker's show. They're on so many other amazing big ministry guests that have written books and they come on the radio show and none of them agree 
None of them agree. All their 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 prophetic timelines and their uh, uh, eschatological understanding of the Bible it all is in one hundred percent discord. It doesn't agree. One person thinks that the Psalms eighty three war is going to happen first, and then after that this is going to happen, and then after that this is going to happen. Uh, you know, and, and and it's like, wait a minute. I wondered, Father, why? Why is there so much disagreement? Everybody's hearing from you. And then I knew one of them participating in the body. They were going off on their own, seeking the Lord, writing a book, and traveling around and telling everybody but what they thought the Lord told them on their own. Call the Maxwell Smart Cone of Silence. Praise Jesus. And and it's like when you break <laughs> out of that Maxwell Smart Cone of Silence, as it were, and you start saying, wait a minute, being in the body, I'm going to have a schism in my body. And I don't want to have a schism. If we we are walking through the harvest fields together, which we will be, and one person has the gift of discerning of spirits, person has the gift of miracles and healing. The person who has the gift of discerning of spirits, person has a gift of the word of wisdom, or, or I'm sorry, the word of knowledge. We want to listen to the person who has discerning of spirits and the word of knowledge because they're going to warn us that around that corner are people who want to shoot us to death with machine guns. And we want to hear the person that says discerning of spirits because we want to know that that entity heading toward us is not human. And, and and, 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 and we want to have the people who have the other gifts with us because united in that one spiritual body, our overall total capabilities are unstoppable. It has been seen by people like Ken Peters when he got his vision of the tribulation and he saw people walk, Christians walking together. Uh, 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 Frances Hunter in her book, um, How to Heal the Sick, when she saw it was always large groups of Christians walking together, unified in one mm-hmm. body, operating together yeah. in the in, in in the power of Jesus Christ, unstoppable, yeah, yeah. literally able to walk through beatings and bullets and fire without any of it touching them. And I believe that that unity in spirit is what's going to cause us to be unstoppable through the power of Christ and also aware yeah. of what's coming because we have to listen carefully because God doesn't give anybody all the pieces of the puzzle. Right, right, and I think that's one reason he does pour out these dreams and visions because we are we're all fascinated with other people's dreams and visions, and and we kind of listen to the dreams and visions more than just someone's opinion. Let me share one final dream that wasn't mine, but I have thought of this dream for over 15 years. I don't know her last name, but her first name was Ruth Ann, and her dream was a large group of Christians, like you said, a huge group of Christians walking through the wilderness somewhere, and the enemy was for them. The Lord sent animals. Animals totally enclosed the humans, wild beasts that you don't want to mess with, so that the enemy could not get in to the circle. Every now and then, one Christian would say, it's my time to testify. They would leave the circle, give their life as a martyr so that they could spread a testimony. Wow. I love love that dream. Wow. Yeah, it it uh one of the most revealing books I've ever read was The Pilgrim Church. Uh and of course over time the devil corrupts always over time the devil corrupts. Uh but in the early early uh you know first century, second century, third century, uh even up uh to later times like to um you know the 1100s and such like that, uh, but anyway, when you when you um, read the Pilgrim Church, the earliest um, generations of the of the Apostolic Church groups when they were martyred, it was their martyrdom. It was their joy. It was their. I believe that they were given the same supernatural peace that you were shown in the dream of the guillotines. I believe that they were given that peace because otherwise there's no way that they could have laid down their lives with joy and absolute utter faith in such a way that the people around them, their minds were utterly blown. What happened was, believe it or not, when you study this historically, and, and, and a lot of this is derived from you know, ancient letters that were uncovered and stuff in people's testimonies. Um, uh, but basically, uh, the moral of the story was that if it wasn't for the early Christians that laid down their lives, singing songs of praise as they were being uh, uh, ultimately led to their execution, 
uh, even to the point where evidently the Emperor Nero put his hands over his ears and said, why do those Christians have to sing, sing, sing? It was driving him crazy because it was <laughs> demons. And, um, you know, that joy that came and people, because of that martyrdom, because of them being so overfilled with that peace and joy that they were about to be with Jesus. People saw that was their persecutors were so overwhelmed with faith and stupefaction. Just, I don't know what the word is. They were just, they saw, they couldn't believe it. And they fell to their knees and they worshiped the Lord and asked Jesus into their heart just by witnessing what happened with the martyrs that died in peace. That when, and, and they became those persecutors, those cuters, ultimately became the next generation missionaries who rode on horseback into Asia and spread the gospel really? of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wow. amazing? The Father used the, the peace and the love and the singing and the hymns of the people laying down their lives to blow the minds of the people persecuting them so badly, so amazingly, that they got on their horses, gave their lives to Jesus, and became missionaries and rode rode into Asia and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ as a result of it. That is just how God works. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture. Um, I think I have it here. Yeah. Listen to this. Psalms 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Yeah. Uh, imagine yeah. that. Isn't that cool? Uh, it's just so awesome how the Lord is revealing all, I think, all of the mysteries of the Bible to us now, all of those who are so hungry for them. Praise God. Um, and um, uh, did you have anything else you want to share, or did you want to close with a prayer? And do please share once again uh, your website with people, too. Okay. I will. I want to close with a little song that I created. I didn't create the song. This This song... The Lord told me to start teaching my youngest, my youngest child um, songs to sing in case we were ever separated and he was in a dangerous situation. Scriptures. So every now and then I'll read the Bible and a scripture will kind of come off the page and I'll hear the Lord say, put it to a melody for your son. So the one I'm going to sing, and this will be my closing prayer, um, and my, my website again is communionbread.org, um, but... The, this, the song I'm going to sing is the prayer. This is so sweet. It's the prayer that Jesus said as he laid down his life, and it's the prayer that Stephen said as he laid down his life when he was being stunned to death. And I hope I can sing. Um, I will try it, okay? Yeah, amen. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. They know not what they do. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That is awesome. God bless you. And real quick, Sister Beth, would you once again just share the website so people can get in touch with you? Okay. My website is communionbread.org, and it's um, I have a little testimony that I wrote. It's a little book form. Uh, you can also obtain a little book. Um, I wrote it for prisoners because I was uh, pen-palling prisoners, and I also wrote it for unwed mothers. You can hear all about my testimony uh, in that book as well. So that's how you get a hold of me, John. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I really appreciate your ministry you. in the Lord and your love for the body of Christ. And I hope to talk to you again soon one day. Oh, I'm just an email away. I, I I try to answer all my emails. I'm actually kind of obsessive about it. Sometimes I need to, you know, take a Tylenol PM and actually get a good night's sleep. Praise Jesus. But anyway, 
Thank you so much for joining us tonight. What a blessing. I just love this testimony because it's such a confirmation. God bless you all. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, Spread the word out there, folks. Be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. That doesn't have to grab a megaphone, but you definitely want to let people know. Help them to try to wake up. Help them to understand that we're all going to receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and a supernatural peace that passes all understanding, being on our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus as these things start to happen. Praise God. Thank you so much for joining us, Sister Beth. God bless you.